Thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak. And I'm conscious that I am one of the last things between you and the bar uh, on your train home. So I'll try and make this um, uh, not so much data heavy or fact heavy, but more um, my thoughts on what transformational leadership uh, means and um, thinking about a sector outside FE, something which is similar but uh, obviously quite different. I know that you as a group have been talking about transformational leadership in organisations and I believe that you've had some speakers talking about individual organisations that have seen uh, transformation. But the thing that I am interested in um, from the perspective of the Mayor's Office is transformational leadership in a sector. Is it possible to see transformation beyond any individual organisation that can change the way that people in a whole sector or a whole policy area feel, as well as the people outside that sector, the way that they perceive it? Uh, and I think that it's a much more interesting challenge because when we talk about individual organisations transforming, we often focus on the charismatic leader or their senior leadership team. And there's a huge amount invested on that individual. But I think that real transformation, which goes much further than that, re requires a whole other range of factors. And, um, and I, I'll go on to explain um, what I think, um, or, or an example, I think, uh, of this, which has taken place in Britain in the last uh, 20, 25 years. And that sector is the arts and cultural sector, which is the other hat that I wear at City Hall. Um, so I was racking my brains last night and I was trying to think, what, what, how, can I, how can I talk with meaning about another area which might be of interest? And the arts and cultural sector I know very well and I've been living it for the last eight years. And it's an incredible sector because at the moment in Britain, it is the one area of British life, British society, that is regarded as world class around the world. That it's regarded as truly exemplary, world leading. We have delegations from other cities, other countries around the world coming to my office asking us how has Britain, how has London developed such a strong, such a well-respected set of cultural organisations and arts organisations? What's, been, what's, what's the, been the secret ingredient? And if you look at the arts and cultural sector today, it's extremely large, it's a very high employer, it has extremely high status both in this country and abroad, uh, it, it has fantastic cultural leaders from Nick Sirota at the Tate to Alex Beard at the Opera House to some of our uh, smaller arts and theatre organisations that are doing transformational things around the world. It's a, it's a sector that we can be proud of and I'm proud to work with. But it wasn't always the case. About 20 years ago, the arts and cultural sector went through a serious crisis in this country. And just to take one example, the Royal Opera House, which I sit on the board of, uh, today is regarded as one of the best opera houses in the world. It has uh, a turnover of around 100 million pounds. It's extremely good value for money because the number of productions, the quality of productions, its audience every night is 95% at capacity. It's a very, very well-respected organization. But 20 years ago, it was in crisis. And I don't know if any of you ever saw the BBC television program, The House, which was a fly on the wall documentary of the Opera House, which the leadership at the time allowed the BBC to come in and film a documentary of them, just the behind the scenes thing, very naively thinking it would be nice publicity for them. And it exposed the horror of running an Opera House in this country and what it was like to be working in an arts organization. And it's fair to say that it was possibly the lowest point in the Opera House's reputation because what the documentary showed was, as you would expect, divas being divas, arts leaders complaining about the kind of hoi polloi coming into their doors. We don't want those kinds of people. We want nice, well-dressed, suited and booted people. Uh, they got very, the public got a very good insight into the elitism, the, the snobbery, but also the colossal uh, waste of money, uh, one ballet production ran massively over budget, and all this was shown on television to a public. It, the TV programme won many awards as it happened, so it was fantastic for the TV producers. But it, it, it marked a real low point for the Opera House and a point of crisis. And actually following that programme, the Opera House nearly verged on bankruptcy. And, and the, the chair of the organisation had to appear in front of a parliamentary select committee 
and had to explain that unless the government bailed them out, they, would, they were in debt with £4 million, they would not be able to pay their staff, they would have to close. And this is the Royal Opera House, a premier institution. So hugely embarrassing for the, for the government, for the country, for the board, uh, and for the art form, which had always been regarded as something elitist, not really something for the people, and now that was seen to be proven to be true. And that, that journey that the Opera House took 20 years ago to what it is today, a completely transformed organization with a balanced budget, with a, a budget that does not rely actually primarily on public subsidy. Only a third, roughly, of its budget comes from the Arts Council. It earns a huge amount more income. It's very, very good at fundraising now. It's extremely well respected. The journey that that organization took, I think, contained a number of ingredients which are actually translatable across the art sector generally in Britain. And there were many organizations that were in a similar position to the Opera House, where they had boards that were slightly out of touch with the public, they had financial problems looming, they didn't know how to fundraise, they were not very good at partnership, deeply, deeply competitive with each other, not a huge sense of collaboration. And the art sector in general took a journey in the last 25 years, which I think, and I'll bear with me, I will come on to, to how I think it's relevant to the FE sector. Um, but I, I, I would call it, and this is um, completely made up on the hoof, seven steps to success. Seven, because that's all I could think of on the way here. Um, but there were seven um, key factors in, in, in that journey. The first is that in order to have transformational change in a whole sector, you need a point of crisis. It's only when you're at your absolute lowest and you think that things have become incredibly difficult that there is a force of change. Because what was happening in the art sector up until the mid-90s was a complacency, a sense of muddling along. We can carry on. We can just about keep getting our grant. We can just about get one more donor to give us enough money to keep the thing uh, uh, afloat. And the, the case of the Opera House and other arts organizations was that they realized that they were really struggling. And government funding uh, was not going to keep coming whilst the reputation of the art sector was at a low. So crisis is uh, not to want to sound like a, one of these business gurus, but crisis is our friend because it forces everyone to, it, to concentrate their minds and to recognize that something needs to be done because lethargy and stasis is um, one of the enemies of reform. Um, a second factor, which actually I think is only one small aspect of this, is the individual charismatic leader. Um, the willingness of one person to say, I have a vision, I'm prepared to stick with it, and I'm going to bring everyone with me. Um, that's the side of the FE sector that I'm not worried about, actually. I've met lots of individual charismatic leaders, and I think that um, with a degree of autonomy, um, I think that, that, that they will fly. And I've seen this in the art sector where you do have amazing leaders who didn't realize how amazing they were until they were given a serious chance to do something differently. Um, but, but charismatic leaders who can bring a team and bring people with them, and who can also communicate what they are doing externally. And one of the things that the Royal Opera House had uh, from uh, around 2001 onwards was um, the leader, Tony Hall, who's now the Director General of the BBC. Uh, but it was the confidence in him, the confidence, confidence that he exuded about the organization and the, the, the people that he was bringing in that gave a lot of the donors the confidence to keep funding the, arts uh, the, the Royal Opera House. And it also gave confidence to the government and to the Arts Council that they had the right guy in place. The third thing uh, I think uh, that's, that's, that's crucial to transformational leadership is analysis. And in the arts sector, Arts organizations were never really encouraged or forced until relatively recently to think about their audience and to understand data and to understand who was giving, why they were giving, motivations. It, they were not commercially led organizations. They were used to receiving grant funding. It's a model, by the way, that is still the case in the continent. Most European arts organizations will get the vast majority of their funding from government. And as a result, their opera houses are not as full. They do not worry about getting bombs on seats because they don't need to worry in the way that organizations in Britain do. And that sense of counting, measuring, analyzing um, is really important. But it's not just about the number crunching or the quantitative data. It's having a strategic analysis of where your organization sits in relation to everything else. And the Opera House did, along with the Arts Council, 
a, a, a very a, a high degree of thinking about the overall arts ecology in the country. And, and I think in doing that, they started to understand where concentrations of excellence were, where ideas could be shared and, and partnerships could be developed. And there was just much greater sense of a system um, that organizations don't operate in a vacuum, that they need to be supported and really think outside their own uh, parameters and, and, and think more broadly. Fourth ingredient, I think, is entrepreneurialism. Um, when you have less funding, you ha are forced to go out and find new ways of bringing in income. And that is the case with the arts organizations that we've seen. They have been much more aggressive about fundraising, about being commercial, about getting bombs on seats. One of the best examples from the Opera House that I can think of is at some point in the mid-2000s, maybe 2006, 2007, the Opera House did something incredibly radical, which was a partnership with the Sun newspaper. And you can imagine the audience of the Opera House. The traditional audience of the Opera House does not read the Sun newspaper. But Tony Hall decided with his marketing team that they needed to transform the way the opera was seen by the general public and who better to go with than a tabloid newspaper where the readers would not traditionally go to the Opera House. And they did a deal on Don Giovanni, where they promoted Don Giovanni in an offer through the Sun newspaper. And they just explained, it's all about sex and violence. And it worked, and it was brilliant success. And lots of people who would never consider going to the opera for the first time went. Now, I'm not saying that the Opera House has completely transformed its audience. It hasn't. It has a very long way to go. But what it completely transformed is the people's perception of that organization trying to get a new audience. And that transformed the Arts Council's uh, perception of the Opera House. These are people who are hungry for an audience. They want to go out and broaden, broaden what they're doing. And it also made investors feel good about giving money to the Opera House. There was, a, for a long time, an attitude that if you gave money, you were elitist too. And they want to, people want to be associated with success and with, with an organization that believes that it, you know, it has a wider moral mission, um, which um, I'll come on to. Um, system awareness is the fifth, um, uh, the, the fifth point I would make. And I think that is incredibly important, as I've mentioned already, um, with any organization. It needs to be part of a bigger system, uh, particularly if it's funded through government or public funding. By the way, stop me if I'm talking for too long. Um, if this is, um, uh, I don't want to eat into question time. Um, uh, so um, I think where it's relevant in the arts, um, uh, the system leadership um, was a really important factor in thinking about uh, how you bring organizations together and how you develop strategic innovation. So the Arts Council, funded the National Theatre and the Royal Opera House to start innovating with screening through cinemas. So live performance of opera, of theatre productions in cinemas around the country. And these two organisations have led the way in that and it's completely transformed their audience uh, participation, their audience demographic. People who cannot travel down to London, who can't pay for a ticket to come to uh, uh, to a ballet in London or go to uh, an Alan Aitborn play at the National Theatre can buy a £10 ticket and go to their local cinema and they can feel part of an experience. That strategic innovation would not be possible were it not for the Arts Council entrusting a big organisation, a national organisation to do it. But what they have done has changed everyone's expectations of digital. Digital is now something that arts organisations realise that they have to understand, they have to be part of. And uh, I think that system awareness where individual organizations can innovate for the benefit of everybody is really, really vital. Um, sixth, governance. Um, if you think about not just the big arts organizations like the Opera House and the National Theatre or Sadler's Wells, they've always had pretty good governance because uh, individual philanthropists, business leaders, you know, uh, successful celebrities want, you know, like the prestige of being involved in these organizations. I think arts organizations have one advantage over every other sector. They are still prestigious. Even when they are uh, in the doldrums, they're still very sexy organizations to be part of. They throw great parties and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, uh, I think for lots of smaller organizations in this country, one of the most liberating things has been museums, galleries, smaller uh, 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 charities, uh, no longer just taking their governors from the local authority. 
bringing in new talent, new high capacity governance with expertise and skills, and using those people in a much more entrepreneurial way. That transformation hasn't been completed. There are still areas in the arts and cultural world where they could do with more governance, more people being involved. But I think taking arts sector out of just the local authority control has been actually a very liberating experience, if a, if a slightly painful one. Because when you leave a local authority, you leave some of the comfort of your big funder uh, looking after you. Uh, and then core mission, which actually I don't need to talk about that much, because I think you all as individual organisations have a sense of core mission. But as a system, I think that um, it's important that there is a system-wide core mission and something that, uh, that we all feel that we uh, are part of and we're signed up to. In the art sector, the core mission became great art for everybody. It was led by the Arts Council, but it became about widening the participation of all people in the arts. And that has now become the mantra. And nobody in the art sector believes or would say the arts is fine if only a few people are coming to my opera house and are enjoying it and I don't mind. They want to go out and bring in new people because they're passionate about what they do and they genuinely believe that if they're given a chance they can bring new audiences in. And I think core mission, moral mission, uh, is something that also changes other people's perception of you. So how is this relevant to FE? And I'll spend the last five minutes on this very quickly. One, crisis. I don't know if I would describe what we're seeing now in FE or vocational education generally is crisis, you might, you might think it is, but it's certainly a point of change and a realisation that things need to change. Um, and I think the fact that you're all here talking about transform transformational leadership is indicative of that. Um, second, individual leaders, I said, as I said, not, not something I'm worried about. I think those leaders are there. Uh, I do think there is an issue about status, recruitment and payment, which is responsibility of the system as much as it is of individual organisations, and we can talk about that. Third, analysis. Um, I'll mention area review in this context. It is extremely helpful if you are leading an area review process to know what is going on and to have that data. And as individual colleges, knowing what else is going on around you, I think is just an incredibly important thing. And if the area review does one thing, it is just enlightenment about the whole context and the whole landscape. But it, it, it's a prompting for self-reflection as well, uh, which I think is important. Um, fourth, entrepreneurialism. Uh, going out, making collaborations, new partnerships. If, as a result of area review or devolution, there is a greater willingness to work collaboratively as a system, then that is a very positive thing, because from that will come strategic innovation and new uh, ideas, and there will be a hunger for going out and in involving businesses even more. And I, actually, I, I, I say that I've seen lots of colleges that have extremely good relationships with business. It's a mistake to assume that colleges are not all uh, uh, independent providers or uh, or others are not engaging with, with um, employers. I think that, that that is happening, but there's certainly a need to turbocharge it. Fifthly, um, system awareness, and a, a sense of a system. Uh, and this is where, from our perspective in London, a regional government, a mayoral system, a mayoral approach is really important because to some extent you want autonomy in the system. You want people to feel that they can make decisions that they're responsible for. But you also, they also need to know the knock-on effects of every decision they make. And they need to feel that there is some sense of central planning or some intelligent design uh, overlooking everything. And as long as it's not rigid, as long as it's not so uh, uh, oppressive, then a sense of system coordination, particularly on strategic issues like recruitment, teacher training, should we have a London challenge for FE? These are the kinds of questions that we're asking because the fragmented system of individual colleges each having to go out and to do that by themselves, I just don't think is sustainable. It doesn't make sense. And I could have easily given a half hour talk about the school system in London, which I think has gone through that change. Um, and again, it's not perfect, there's a long way to go, but that sense of a collective uh, responsibility and mission and system is, it ha has been uh, firmly planted. Um, sixth, governance. Uh, I think there are some excellent governors in FE, but there's also a need to bring in new people and new ideas and new talent, and how do we do that? Uh, and high, high capacity, high quality uh, governors. Um, and then finally, on mission. Um, I think if area review and devolution are just about structural change, 
then they will have missed an opportunity. For me, the moral mission for vocational education is that it is absolutely part of the 21st century. And in London, we know that there are many, many young people who come out of school, who come out of post-16 education, and they have not been given as much of an opportunity, as much of a rigorous vocational education as they could have. They've not been given the choice in some cases. They don't even know um, what's available. Their careers guidance maybe hasn't been uh, brilliant. But vocational education is fundamental to the success of the city. And of course, academic routes, the university route, and the university route doesn't exclude the vocational route either. Um, but we need to have a sense that vocational education uh, and the quality, the commitment to specialization, higher level skill, as well as second chance provision and all those things, um, that they are absolutely relevant and not, not a, uh, um, uh, a kind of uh, a second best choice, a sort of, well, we have to do something about this cohort of people, whether they're young or old, but that there is a positive uh, almost celebratory attitude to vocational education. I would like to see a system in London and ideally around the country where um, we are proud of our vocational system and we say to other countries around the world, look how fantastically we're doing it. Don't look at Germany, their system isn't perfect. Actually what we're doing here um, is, is genuinely impressive. And I, I think that the opportunity is there now uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, I hope that we in London can play our part. But, um, that I think there, there, there is a huge complexity in the, in the task ahead. And if, if individual leaders feel that they're supported and that they are part of a bigger collective mission, I think their job becomes easier because they're not fighting against the tide. Um, so um, I guess I, I would like to commit that we will um, do what we can in London and hopefully um, that there will be a, a sense of that happening nationally as well.